Now, if that was perfect, we wouldn't need any other agreement or arrangement. But we understand it's imperfection. Now, I need to just share something else with you. There is something about the church of the living God. When we decide to turn for better. Listen. I truly believe that the church can live a clean, pure life without sin. I truly believe that. I don't believe every day I've sinned. As some people say, in word, thought, and deed. No. The Bible says, if. If doesn't suppose that it's frequent. Otherwise, you could say when. He says, if you sin. We have an advocate with the Father. Yes. So the first thing God is saying, there is power in purity. Yes. There is power in holiness. Yes. And we need to understand it because it, it, it will affect how God moves amongst us. Yes. Okay. Now, Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. And in Exodus chapter 25, I want to show you the privilege he had as mediator. Exodus chapter 25, verse 21 and 22. Now this has to do with the presence of God. Now the mediator is the one that stands in the middle. We understand that. And God gave him the, the law. He gave him all the statutes. So here comes the operation of the mediator. Now God says here, he's given instructions about the Ark of the Covenant. He says, and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the Ark. And in the Ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there, where is that? Top of the mercy seat. And there I will meet with thee. And I will commune with thee from above, above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony. Of all things, take note, of all things which... I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. The understanding of that scripture is that God resided in a particular place. He resided in a cloud between the two cherubims on top of the mercy seat. And the mediator heard directly from God. And as he heard from God, he passed it on to the people. Okay. Now, Aaron represents the high priest. And there is something about the Day of Atonement that we need to understand. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, first of all, had to offer a sacrifice for himself. Because, you see, where the high priest was going, he's right into the Holy of Holies, and the high priest was going into the presence of God where he dwelt amongst between the two cherubims on top of the mercy seat. Amen. So when, when God broke out against Aaron's rebellious sons, it was because they came too close to the presence of God and they weren't protected in that they weren't sanctified. So God warned, he says, Moses, tell Aaron, he cannot come before me often, but only when I choose. So now this is what happened in, in practice. When Aaron offered um, uh, blood for his own self. So the blood is substitutionary. Rather than Aaron die, something died to keep him alive. And God says that's just a covering. So when he came now, and then he, 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 you know, he confessed the sins of the people, and he brought blood in. And then he took the hyssop, and then he took the blood, and he sprinkled it upon the mercy seat. Provided Aaron or the high priest comes out, it means
means it's a good sign. But if he doesn't come out, it means no one can stand in the presence of God. But take note, when he comes out, there needs to be a word. There needs to be a message to say the atonement is effected and we can rejoice that God has covered our sins for another year. Yes. Now, brethren, I want to tell you, blood is powerful. Because according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24, it gives us an understanding about Jesus. Let's read. I'm taking my time. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. And here it gives a reflection of what it was like uh, at Mount Sinai. Amen. Let's read from verse 21 to, to give you more understanding. So now it described what it was like when the fire of God came down upon Mount Sinai. So it says here, and so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. That was the reflection of Sinai. But for the church, we have come unto Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, let's look at Jesus. And to Jesus. The mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now I need to share with you that blood has speech. Because you see, the blood represents the life of the person and when God gave us life he also gave us the ability to communicate with him so when you read about Abel the Bible says by faith Abel offered up unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained with the witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts and he being dead yet speaketh so how can a dead man speak a dead man speak through his blood and the life that of Abel was in the blood so when the life left him what was in Abel's heart was spoken by the blood and the blood was saying unto God God avenge me because my brother has bought has, has murdered me God you declared me righteous why should the righteous suffer God avenge me now that was what his blood said but when you come to the mediator Jesus the mediator blood doesn't say that the mediator's blood has a speech. He says, God, they be our sinners. I have paid the price for them. God, though you are holy, and you should slay them, but God, my blood, is speaking for them. This is why you could be in this um, church right now. You may not know anything about salvation. But if you can have faith in the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus is so powerful and so efficacious that God will fill you tonight to prove the power and the efficacy and the authenticity of the power of his blood to let the world know you are saved. Not because you look good, but you are saved through faith in the blood. Oh, Jesus! 
The Bible says, for he is the propitiation for our sins. And not just ours only, but the sin of the entire world. Find the vilest sinner. Don't tell him he's going to hell. Tell him have faith in the blood of Jesus. Because this blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Thank you, Jesus. Better. Okay, so now oh, we see John. Hallelujah. And when John saw Jesus, John made a statement. He says, Look, I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, but there's one who cometh after me, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not even worthy to untie. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost Hallelujah. with fire. Yeah. Now it's very important. There is an interface. An interface literally speaks of a division. But you can go from one dimension into another. So when John met Jesus, the law met grace. Yes. Listen. Yeah. John represents the end of the law but the law can only condemn a man but when John met Jesus God is saying there's a transition from being under the condemnation of the law stepping into a new transition where you get mercy and grace multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ so when John met Jesus the implication was when he said, I can only baptize you unto repentance. The law can only take you so far. The law can only tell you how bad you've been. But the law can't solve your sin problem. So what you need then is repentance. So that when you are truly repented, you're in a position to meet grace. So the Bible says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So then, the transition, the end of the law, the beginning of a new mediator, the end of types and shadows, the beginning of reality. Now, Elijah wanted the, pe the people to know the true God will show his approval by fire. Now, in the Old Testament, it was rich in times. You couldn't go into God's presence without seeing fire. You walk into the outer court, the first thing that hits you is a blazing, a blazing bra brazen altar full of fire. God says, this fire must never go out. Then when she says, well, look, I understand that. You step into the holy place. Bishop, you found more fire. Because there was fire at the golden candlesticks. And you know, you know when you understand fire, there's something about fire. So long as fire has fuel, it will always burn. You know what God told the high priest? He says, this light in the, in, 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 in the holy place must never go out. Now, what God is really saying, the Old Testament dispensation shows you he's so rich in types and shadows. So if anybody wants to find divine fire, find God's people. And when you find God's people, you will definitely find God. Because where does God dwell? He doesn't dwell in bricks and mortar. He dwells in his people. For his people are his, is his temple. So then, when we look in the Old Testament, you see the golden candlesticks. And I like what um, Brother Ellis said. And he talks about revelation. The fire of God brings revelation. It brings enlightenment. It brings radiation. You can't be on fire and not affect your neighbor. Have you ever gone into a house on fire? You can't get into that fire before the radiation from the fire affects you. So God was really 
showing them, he says, look, this is not the reality, but I want to show you how powerful it is, because the golden candle speaks candlestick speaks of illumination it speaks of revelation it, I tell you it wasn't a lot of light but whatever it was it can move all the darkness then you think that God would have just stopped there he says no there's more so he says I want to show you what the old dispensation was like so he says I want to show you the power of prayer so he says let me take you to the altar of incense because there's fire at the altar of incense and the fire at the altar of incense should never ever go out if you are a believer then you are not on fire praying if you stop praying it means the fire Listen, that's just just to warm you up. Because if you step into the Holy of Holies, you step into divine fire. My own essence. And that's why when they took strange fire, before God, they didn't even get that far. The Bible says fire came out from the presence of God Almighty and consumed them. Brethren, let's talk about Jesus. I like the Old Testament. And I like the way God kind of veils things, covers it up, causes it to scratch your head when you read. But when you talk about Jesus, he makes it so plain that even the very ignoramus can read about Jesus and have an understanding. He may not understand the seven golden candlesticks, nor the altar of incense. But if you tell him about Jesus, he'll understand. And when you study the scriptures, every single thing in the Old Testament dispensation speaks of Jesus. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a revelation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, let's look at Jesus. Not just the mediator, but the perfect mediator. Now take note, Moses the mediator would go, could go and hear from God, from the presence of God, from the mercy seat, on top of the mercy seat. But Moses was not the real mediator, for the real mediator is Jesus. Now let's talk about the blood of Jesus. Because we understand that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the life of God was wrapped up in blood. How can God, how can his life be wrapped up in blood? It's a great mystery. But I'll tell you something. If you look at types and shadows again, you find on the day of uh, the Passover, when God wanted to deliver Israel, he could have killed everybody, but he chose not to. He says, I'm going to show you another sign. I could have sent fire from heaven, but he, did, he chose not to. He could have sent lightning and boulders. He chose not to. But what he chose to do was just to get a lamb and kill the lamb and tell them to take the blood of the lamb and put upon the doorpost. He didn't finish there. He commanded them to get some fire, burn the lamb, have some roast lamb with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And you need to eat that lamb. You need to be part of the fire that I command this day. So, when when they came and they, they got in and they were they were eating their lamb because the blood was already upon the doorpost. So when the angel of death passed and he saw the blood, he saw the atoning blood, he saw life that was given for the house, which was a lamb that preserved the life that was in the house. Hallelujah. That was just a type. But the reality is what John saw. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Hear me now. The other person who knew 
everyone understood the presence of God was the high priest. So Jesus is unique. He's both the Lamb of God and he's also the high priest. Hallelujah. So hear what happened. The high priest allowed himself to be killed. He gave up his suji, gave up his natural life. And his blood was speaking. Do you know I know his blood was speaking? One of the two feet heard. And when he heard, he saw hope at the point of death. And he says, Father, Lord, because <laughs> the blood was speaking. You can't be saved by the power of the blood. The life of God. Who is God? My Redeemer. Who is God? My strong power. Who is God? His blood was speaking. And the thief heard. You see, the blood brings conversion. It's powerful. Who can challenge the life of God? So here what happened. They killed the Lamb of God. And the high priest just sat by. Because the high priest, Jesus, knew that the blood that was shed, which is the Lamb's blood, which is him, Jesus has many roles. Whilst they killed him, he was still king. Yes. And he was still Lord. Yes. Mystery of mysteries. How can you kill Jesus? He, when you can't kill him, he laid down his life. Amen. Had power to lay it down. Amen. Had power to pick it up again. Amen. So here now, the high priest realized, my priestly duty is not over. So when he was resurrected, my God, Mary saw the high priest. And he thought it was a gardener. And the high priest spoke and says, Mary, touch me not. For I'm not yet ascending unto my God. So what Jesus had to do as high priest was ascending to heaven with his own blood. But so what would he do on the day of atonement? Enter into the holiest of all and pour out his blood on the mercy seat. Now look at the dilemma we've got. The dilemma is if it was the Old Testament, the high priest would come out, he would smile. And everybody would rejoice. Amen. But who can go to heaven? The Bible says no man is ascending into heaven. Only he that came down from heaven. So what Jesus had to do, he realized no man, no man can go and testify whether or not the blood was accepted. So Jesus said, I've got to do it myself. But boys, I tell you what you want to do. I'm going to come and see you. But I want you to go and tarry in Jerusalem. Hear me now. I said blood speaks. So when Jesus chose to speak, do you know what he did? He, because you see, they can't go into the presence. But the presence came to, him, to them. But these disciples were already blood washed. Because Jesus says, he breathed upon them. And he says, receive the Holy Ghost. You can't get the Holy Ghost unless you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So, the blood began to speak. And when it began to speak, hear what happened. Brother Johnson, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place. My God, and there came a sound from heaven, like a rushing mighty wind. And there appeared unto them, cloven tongues, like as a fire. And he sat upon them. The first message wasn't preached by Peter. The first message was preached by the high priest. I found some Chinese Jews and he was speaking in Chinese, testifying of the redemptive power of God Almighty, how that Jesus' blood has been used to cleanse men from all sin. And this is the evidence this is the witness. That's why Joel says, it shall come to pass after what saith the Lord that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters. They shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. 
skeptics and fools that don't believe anything. <laughs> so they said, these men are drunk. Uh -huh. yeah. Can you imagine with wine? The greatest moment, the greatest transition Amen. in human history, where man now hears directly from God, from the mercy seat, and they began to speak the incredible things of the redemptive power of God. Here come some devils infiltrated the minds of some people and they said, hey, these people are just filled with new wine. <laughs> so Peter decides, well look, if you never understand what the high priest say, I better preach to you a little bit myself. Yes. And when Peter finished preaching, now listen, something happened to Peter. Peter before, was Peter who denied Jesus. This Peter, not Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, divine fire upon him. Listen to me. If you ever feel the fire of God, you can never sit still. There is something about fire. Fire is all consuming. Fire is gives heat. Listen to me. God wants to transfer fire upon his people. Listen to me. You cannot stand still if you're on fire. Have you ever seen a person burn naturally with fire? The movements are just phenomenal. You can't tell what the coordination is like because fire hurts. This is what we need in Pentecost. When people come to church, and they're on fire. You don't need a program promise. You need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost in your soul. You need to feel the fire of God. Hear me, church. When Peter preached, Peter was on so much fire. He told them anything he wanted. And when he finished, my God, the Holy Ghost says, Amen, it's true. So they says, Men and brethren, I just They say that when they experience fire. Now let me tell you, in the Psalm, Psalm 104, I believe it's verse 4, the Bible says that God makes his angel spirits and his ministers, my God, his ministers, all the ministers stand up. Every minister must be on fire. Yes. Yes. Listen to me. Yes. Church, if you're not praying for your pastor, the Lord will deal with you. Every minister must be on fire. God said Peter, James, and John, all of those on fire. Bishop, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to anoint every minister in the house. I want them to come out here. Please, it's, it's important. Because you see, God is going to put fire on you first. Just like he put fire on Peter, James, and John. And when the fires begin to burn, hear me, church. Go ahead, Bishop. 
Somebody give him a hand. When the fire begins to burn, hear me now, church. Then that fire will emanate. You have you can't sit still with fire. Hear me now. Those disciples had so much fire. When they sat still, brother nurse, you know what God did? God rose up persecution. Ah, uh, what did he do? To scatter the fire. And everywhere they went, they came and they brought people on fire. Hear me now. The fire is not just for you. The fire is for the people. The fire is not just for you. The fire is for everywhere you go. Hear me now, church. I want you to know the Jesus that we serve. He is a consuming fire. Church, I want you to stand. I want you to stand. I want you to stretch your hands. The Lord, the men of God. Now listen. Fire of God is upon us. Our ministry can't die. 